Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. My guest today, um, it seems to be a theme, I met in Fiji. Uh, you know, the, Ron, the last few guests have, have all been from Fiji, but uh, I met this man in Fiji and I was just absolutely blown away. And I know I said that about a lot of the guests, but the truth is just the mindset of, of, of Ron Lynch and the way he views things and the way he views marketing and advertising and sales, which is extremely important, was just someone I just really instantaneously connected with and, and really like saw, got a lot of value from what he spoke about. So I wanted to have him on the podcast. We've been trying to get this done for, for a bit, so I'm happy he's here on a holiday weekend doing this. The guy has done $4 billion in direct response revenue. So that's with a B, not an M, four billion. So I just want the listeners to let that sink in when we talk about marketing and how that has to correlate with sales, that his marketing actually sold stuff. He's the CEO of Baby Bath Agency um, and just a great dude. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. And thanks uh, for all the kind words. Sorry? Thanks for all the kind words. They're facts. I, I, didn't, make, I didn't make those stuff up. Um, for the listeners who haven't had the luxury of hearing who you are and, and your story. Why don't you give a little bit of background on how you got started in this industry and all the way up to today. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be brief. There's a few lessons in the brevity. Um, I started out, uh, I'll say I was a, a failed child actor. I, I had worked in a restaurant as a kid and I worked in a grocery store and was a grocery checker during college. And at that point, uh, my college roommate, who was a friend of mine, invited me along to an audition for a film. And I wanted the day off of college and the day off of work. And so we drove 100 miles to this remote location in Washington State. And I uh, auditioned for a film that Robert Altman directed. And Robert Altman was a, uh, a protege of Alfred Hitchcock. He'd, he had done some work on his television show years before. Uh, Altman has now passed away, obviously 30 years ago. And he made a whole bunch of movies that uh, were quite famous in Hollywood. Uh, the original MASH series was uh, developed off of his film MASH, uh, Nashville, uh, all these kind of fantastic movies. And he uh, hired me and I had a SAG card suddenly. And so I went to work on his movie set and I worked as an actor for four days and I stayed on for 30 days as a PA and I started learning how to make movies. And in Seattle at that time, there was a lot of movies being made. And I ended up making 12 or 13 movies because I had a SAG card and I was only, only three guys in town, Brendan Fraser and me and Matt Skerritt, who kind of had SAG cards. And so we, uh, we all ended up in the same movies over and over again together. And um, I stayed on every time and, and learned filmmaking. And I went back to my job as a grocer. And uh, one of the last films that I did, I met Jeff Bridges and Jeff Bridges, uh, uh, I was on set with him and I asked him and I didn't know him. I just happened to be standing next to him and I said, Hey, how do I get in your shoes? And he said, it's really easy. Make sure your dad is Lloyd Bridges. It's like, that's funny. He said, yeah. He said, right. If you can write, you can be, you can do make movies. And I hated writing, but I, uh, and here's the main, the first lesson is do the work first. Uh, he said, right. So I wrote and I wrote two movies and then I went back to my grocery checking job. And there was a lady that worked, that worked on television. Uh, she was an afternoon talk show host in Seattle, and she used to come through my line. I was a grocery checker. And uh, she came through one day, and I said, hey, I wrote two movies. You work in TV. Do you know anybody who could help me? And she said, yeah, bring your movies in. So she, I brought the movies in. Turned out her sister was Kathleen Kennedy, who was Steven Spielberg's partner. Um, but none of that would have happened if I hadn't just taken risks and done the work first. Um, so I ended up leveraging those scripts into something called a Chesterfield Award and started writing screenplays in my free time while I was working in a grocery store. And I learned in the grocery store how to sell, how to understand margins, how to understand P&Ls. And I eventually worked my way up and I became a chief operating officer and a store director for this grocery company. And I did that for um, about 10 years. In my, that was my 20s. Um, and uh, it was an incredible business school to have employees, unions, perishables, departments, uh, having to change the marketplace from being low-end customers to high-end customers to, to really learn a lot of things. And one of the things we did in the store was cooking demonstrations. And I had a friend who did cooking, who was launching the George Foreman Grill. And he asked if he could come into my store and shoot some footage in our cooking kiosk. And I said, yes. And 
at that moment, when they came in, I met Sam Perlmutter, who is George Foreman's agent, and I had a screenplay that I gave him, which he took home, read on the airplane, and purchased. And about two weeks later, I changed careers. I left the grocery business, I had sold a movie, and I went into the infomercial business, which was really cooking demonstrations on TV. So I had this background of business and filmmaking, and I put those together, and that was the launch for me that got me started. And since then, I've launched um, 300 different products and 70 different brands and have had a hand in a number of things that people are aware of. The most famous one for most people is GoPro. As we, we originally launched GoPro on, on television and created the strategy for that. Wow. So a couple of ways I, I want to take this. I think, I think one big lesson in there is people oftentimes look for ways to kill deals and not make deals. And it looked like you always just found a way to say yes at the right time and, and just try it and try to figure out a way to make things work. But what would you tell the listeners who are like, well, look, complete luck, right? Luck that the right person walked through the grocery line for him, um, like the script, luck for all that. You know, like where does luck play into, into your career path? Um, I, I think that there is a, a destiny there for you to fulfill, but you must be prepared to fulfill it. So my luck was that I was lucky enough to have written a screenplay and have it done. I did the work first. You must do that. And most people, even in Hollywood, have an idea of a screenplay. And they pitch the idea. And then if somebody buys the idea, then they go write it. It's much simpler to just go write it. Because um, people think that's a lot of work, and it's not. It takes two or three days for me to write a screenplay. People are like, oh, my God, it takes months and years. It doesn't. I wrote my book in five days. It's having the discipline to sit down and pick up the shovel and get off your ass and do it. Um, I believe in doing work for free initially when you don't have a track record, but I also ha believe in selecting the right work to do for free. You want to select things that have a hell of a good chance of success. So th that's very important. And uh, we can talk about that. I have some metrics for how you pick those things, um, but it's not very difficult. I, I love the, the life mantra of do the work first. How does that translate? Someone who's listening is not an entrepreneur. He's just a regular, um, you know, runs, runs a business or works for a company. How does he interpret that in his lifestyle, in his or her life? I, I'll give you a really simple example was someone who's super famous now and someone who I know is Justin Bieber. He got on YouTube. Literally, he got on YouTube and sang. And it's kind of like, you know, anything. Someone says, hey, I'm, I, th I think I could write a movie or I could write a book or I have a business. Well, all right, show me. Because nobody signs up for your post-it notes, man. Nobody cares. You have to do something in this world to be seen. You can't just have ideas and go, oh yeah. And then years later go, they stole my idea. Remember that time I had that idea? No, nobody remembers that time you had that idea because it's just an idea. Elon Musk had, you have to, you have to, you have to, you know, like people don't know, uh, we could walk to Alaska. I could say, hey, you know what? Next February, I'm going to meet you in Alaska. Let's walk. And from Montreal and from Austin, Texas, we could both end up in Alaska next February. We got off our asses right now and went and did it. And it would be a national t news story. Two guys decided to meet for a beer in Anchorage, Alaska, and they walked. That would, be a, that would go viral. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Very simple. We should do it. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think my legs would, 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 would make it, but yeah. But in pieces, it would. You would make it. It's having the heart and the head to go, okay, I'm going to start that journey. I think most people, we live in a day and age right now where it's easier to talk than it is to actually do. And we live behind, I think social media does, look, blessing and curse, right? It gives everyone a voice. Um, the problem with that is there's a lot of talkers and not a lot of doers. And I think, I think one thing is that, especially on the entrepreneurial journey, I think a lot of people could take that the wrong way and look at other people that are just talking and sit there and say, man, they made it, man. I like, I can't get to that level realizing that there's very little action involved and there's talking they're just pontificating. And if they went and just did, they'd surpass those people instantaneously. Well, and you know, 
it's easy to introduce me as a, you know, the $4 billion guy, but I once was the $12 guy. And then I was a hundred dollar guy. And then, now, you know, like you have to start someplace. Um, but for me, it's always starting with empathy. You don't get rich. You don't get wealthy. You don't have success. You create all of those things, but they're not taken from the world. And I once worked for a guy who was really a miserable effort. And the guy was... By the way, you can swear on this podcast if you want. So. Yeah, I will. Believe me, I'll get there. Um, he was a taker and he led a miserable life. Um, and it was hard to watch because at the one, t in the, you know, you're like, oh, he has a fabulous house. And he has a great family. Well, then he lost his family. Then he lost his house. Then he got, but he was going through the world, like trying to extract shit from people. And I have always found that if you just find something great that people want and go here, they go, oh, I'll take that. And then they tell a friend and another, excellent marketing isn't done by me. And that excellent starts are done be, by me. Excellent marketing is done by the audience. They do it for you ultimately. That's what lowers your cost of acquisition is coming up with something so good that they do it for you. So let, let's talk about that. I mean, again, you, you, you're giving me a lot to work with here. So I, like, let's, let's talk about one thing. You were talking about money and you know, we, we were able to talk a lot when we were together. And one thing that fascinated me was your outlook on life. The almost it is what it is type of attitude of what are you going to do about it? So not just about money, but you also had a really crazy view about money. So one is I want to talk, how do you develop that attitude towards life of it is what it is. Just go do what are you talking about? It's not going to change anything. And then how you view money. Okay, so um, it is what it is came from, you can, you can control your starts, you can control the, the at-bats, you're in charge of the bat, but you're not in charge of the pitcher or the ball. There's all these things that, you're not even in charge of who's on the other bag sometimes, you know? Like, there's, things are gonna be thrown at you, but your purpose is to focus on what you can execute. So focus on what you can execute and get good at what you execute. Then go out and execute it a few times. So that's what's in control. All of the other things that are out of control, including other people's sicknesses, death, employees stealing from you, um, uh, a part breaking on your device after you've sold one million of them and getting a recall, or getting sued or having the FDA say, hey, that ingredient's no longer safe. And you're like, my whole product's built around that ingredient. All of that's outside of your control. And one of the things I say in a lot of talks is I've been a millionaire four times. And at first, when you hear that, you're like, wow, that's quite a brag. And then if you think about that for the second or third second, you realize I fucked it up three times because you have to do it. To do it four times, you must lose it three at least, right? So you're like, okay. So what I learned was the methodology of how to. Now I never know that I'll never be of want because I know some things about how to. And so that's part of what I teach other people is how to. Um, and once you know how to, you can't unknow it. You, you know how to ride a bike. You can't unknow that. Even 90-year-old people, you could still probably get them, if they had their faculties, on a bike and pedaling, even if they hadn't ridden one so that, since they were nine. Because there's these mechanisms that, that lie deep in the brain. And so I've turned my brain into an automatic reflexive device for creating value for other people. And ultimately, that is where we lead to with money, is most of us think that money equals success, or happiness, or freedom, or choices, and it's something that other people have. But I use the word money equals, which is a math question. But the way your brain is currently neurologically wired, when you hear money equals, you hear it as an English sentence of money equals, and you put an emotional attachment to the other side of the equation. And it's the emotional attachment you lack. But if it is truly an equation, does zero money equal zero freedom? No, I still have freedom when I'm broke. Does zero money have, mean zero success? No. Sorry for the high tension wire sound. That's actually the cicadas. It's getting warm here and the cicadas are heating up. 
Um, so this idea of money equals something emotional is just not factual. So then you have to go, okay, what, what is money? And money is representational. It's a byproduct of the value you create in the world. So when we were tribal, you, had, you were out and you were either a hunter or a gatherer and you needed to survive. Well, you can't survive just on your skill set alone. You must belong to a tribe. We're tribal creatures. You need a medicine man. You need a chief. You need a baker. You need a basket maker. You need a baby maker. You need all these things around you. And we tend to think we're alone in the world, but we actually are always tribal. So the, 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 be the people who work the least in the tribe are the ones who provide the most specified value. The doctor, the politician, the lawyer, but like, right? Specified knowledge and the more specified it is when someone gets in trouble means I get the highest revenue and the lowest effort. Garbage men work a lot harder than lawyers, trust me. So, I mean, one of the things that whenever I talk to someone about money and the mindset around money, um, something that I'm always trying to put myself in the listeners, you know, shoes and, and talk about it. It's yeah, very easy for someone who, who made it to talk about money that way. Right. But you know, if I, ha if I had millions of dollars, I'd also say money's not the most important thing in the world. That's um, because there's the fourth, the third law of money, which is money is not, and money is not optional. So when you don't have any, you're all you, that's the thing that F's it up for everybody. I don't have any, therefore I've got to opt in and get some and you're operating out of a starvation mentality and you probably well should. You should probably go get a job and get your basics covered. But the trap people get into is they get their basics covered and they see that somebody else has some more basics. And so they get up and they try to reach for some more basics. Now I can look on the shelf behind you, particularly the one with the Nintendo with the Game Boy and the, the phone and the iPod. Those are all passe to us now. They're not even necessities. Those are actually nostalgic pieces of tech from your past that you no longer need. But there was a moment where they were new and you had to have them. And you get caught in the trap of, I must have these. Now, the other shelf behind you goes back even further to your childhood of things you needed then. These action figures that represented the cartoons and the toys in your mind, they, they imagine, your imagination is captured on that shelf. But when you were a kid, you needed those things. And there's an evolution, literally, of your emotional intelligence behind you of, and that's why you keep you like, I used to be this guy, and then I was this guy, and now I'm this guy. And if you get caught in the pursuit of material possessions, you'll never get out of it because there'll always be a new I something to purchase. There'll be a, what, I'm not cool if I don't have a Tesla, all the rich guys have Teslas. And then you're running for the Tesla, and then you're in a Tesla payment, which is the dumbest thing in the world to do. Get rid of all of your shit, get down to what you actually need, produce more revenue than you spend, and then you're rich. Anybody can do that tomorrow if they have some source of but revenue. The but the Joneses have more. If you reduce what you use, one of the things my wife and I got into debt when we were first married, and I've been married 30 or 29 years this week. After about two years of marriage, we were $30,000 in debt. How the hell did that happen? It was a lot of money in 1990. And so we were like, okay, how do we fix that? And we just cut everything. We moved into a cheaper place. We shared a car. We reversed that, that financial cycle and we got ourselves out of that debt. And then we, you know, bought our first uh, condominium or home when it, you know, and that was an intelligent thing to do at the time. Um, I'm not sure it is these days, but that's, you got to get your expenditures lower then you actually are living like you're rich. When you are saving money and you, ha okay, now if I can produce $500 extra a month, I can start a business, I can be an entrepreneur, but you can't get to the island you wanna get to holding onto the raft you're currently holding onto. And you'll feel like you're rowing and you're rowing and the more responsibilities and costs are just weight inside that raft and you'll be rowing against the current and you'll never get there. 
So the step one is actually getting rid of shit and getting your financial business in order at whatever scale you're currently at. And if you can't do that, then your desire to be wealthy is not greater than your desire for pain. I also, I think human nature, we like to be victims sometimes. Way easier to, to blame other things than it is to actually get off our ass and make changes. Um, but, but aside from that, look, being in the industry I'm in, I got a chance to meet with a lot of people, talked to a lot of people I looked up to, um, audited a lot of accounts. One thing I've noticed is that the Joneses, they're not really that much better off than you. Not when their house burns down, man. They're over at your house crying and you're their friend and you're making lasagna for them. That's so, you know, get no, but even have a sick the, kid. The, the Joneses with the nice house, but can't really afford to make the payments on their house. Like there's so many factors. Like if you peel away that people don't see, but we live in a day and age where you showcase your best out there. Everyone's and, and look, I'm human. I'm guilty of it. I look at things and I'm like, wow, really? That person had this from that. And then I'm like wondering, wait, 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 I know how this game works. And then I take a step back. I'm like, oh, okay, let's facade and, and, and look at it that way. Um, talk to me about, so something I always preach is that the marketing cycle, I think, precedes the sales cycle, right? First, people have to know who you are and that you exist in order for them to buy from you. So talk to me about a little bit about how you view marketing versus, let's say, advertising and and how important is it for marketing to actually sell stuff? So um, I, I honestly don't really, which is weird. I make, I've been making commercials and content my entire professional career now, but I don't really believe in advertising because I believe that advertising is generally an egotistical process from a company to an agency to a customer. And all three of them are egotistical in the process. Um, I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of value exchange. There's a lot of identity exchange. Um, but it's, it's super expensive. And I think that this, that's why I say egotistical because it's super expensive to be egotistical. It always costs you. Um, so you're, you're paying millions of dollars to an agency to create an image for millions of dollars, which is probably overcharged way overbilled. It doesn't cost that much to make TV commercials. And then you're paying extremely expensive time or placement in magazines or television or on the internet uh, to hope that somebody sees you and thinks that's really cool. Maybe I'll go down and buy one. I, I don't, I don't, I've never done that kind of advertising. So it doesn't make sense to me. What marketing is to me is understanding that first of all, 70 to 80% of your consumers pretty much in every category are female and females are, um, oriented towards organization and towards gathering. They're gatherers. So they want to discover and make a decision. They don't want to be forced or coerced or insulted or they simply want to know what they're getting and is, is it wise and does it fit them? And so in marketing, I think that you create, if you create a discovery process where there's a several steps involved and you honor that, they'll opt in at whatever step they feel comfortable opting in at. Um, so you're, it, it, there is kind of an, there's an acquisition process. And one of the things that I think that most advertisers miss, and frankly, a lot of marketers miss, is the satisfaction of them beyond the purchase. Is most, if you ask most people when a, when a sale's done, they'll tell you when you, you know, the cash register rang and you get the money hit your account. And I think that that's about, probably about 60% of it. There's another 40% of satisfaction and making sure that you delivered the product and that they love it and that um, they'll talk about it later to get all that free marketing and, and recircle your, your cycle for you. So, I mean, if you look at it right now, GoPro doesn't do a lot of advertising. They still sell a lot of cameras, but they really don't need to spend millions and millions of dollars advertising. People know what it is and they know when they want one. And that's why they sell them in airports because people forget them at home. And almost every user becomes their advertiser. How can you not? Because when you're out there in the world using one, you're advertising for them. I mean, I remember the first couple of years, it was, I, you know, I ski. It was the, it's the ski slopes, and there's kids all over the ski slopes for those things, advertising for them. Yeah. So how has the industry changed from, from, on, from making infomercials to now the online game? 
the industry hasn't changed, just the delivery mechanisms have changed. The, the business that I'm actually in is the medicine man business from the fair circuit 150 years ago. I pull my wagon into town and I open up the canvas and I go, ladies and gentlemen, children, step right up, step right up. I've got something to show you. Have you ever seen, do you have this problem? Do you have this? That's what, it's the same business. And then in the, the 50s, it became the advertorial. It became David Ogilvy in a long article inside a magazine that didn't look like an ad. It looked like it was interesting. It's education in this process. And then it became the infomercial. And now it's online and it's the infomercial cut up into 30 pieces. I get your attention at the beginning. Then I show you an animation of what the product is. Then I show you the product itself. Then I say, hey, you can win one of these to get you to mentally adopt it like a four-year-old entering a contest and you enter a contest and you mentally have adopted the product. Now you go, I want it. Great. Now I just keep advertising to you with offers until you buy it. Because yeah. you want it and it didn't show up in the mailbox. So I, I don't think that it's any different. Uh, let, let me ask you this. Do you think that the process of finding a mate has changed in 1 million years? No, I just think we have more ways to find it. Just, just different tools, but it's still, you know, we, we all generally start with a cocktail or a cup of coffee. So do you find that most people throw out real world sales tactics or real world like marketing tactics when it comes to online because they go direct for that sale and they ignore how the real world actually works? Yeah, but I think that they go directly for that sale and they get some and they think that's how well my advertising worked, <laughs> good or bad. So I, I saw a comment from somebody yesterday and they, they were wrangling with, I think a potential coaching client. They were like, my client says he doesn't need me because he closes 90% of the time. And he said, what do you think the problem there is? I said, I think the top of the funnel's broken. Because if you're closing 90% of the time, you clearly haven't asked enough people because you should only be closing about 20% of the time, yeah. 30%. If you, if you were closing 20 or 30%, that would, in my mind, that means you would be ha having a lot more people. Your pipeline's full. Yeah, yeah, your pipeline's full. It's like you, you're working on, that's like me saying, hey, could I sell Kirby vacuum cleaners door to door? Yeah, and I probably have an 85% close ratio because I'm an infomercial guy. Like, I could do that. Do you think that would be me maxing out my personal revenue? Or would that be idiotic? Pretty idiotic. Um, Good place to learn, but it's a bad place to build wealth. Do you think the small brands still have a chance to compete against the big boys? That They always have. That's never not been the case. New brands are created constantly. There was no bulletproof coffee five years ago. Now Dave Asprey's huge. Bulletproof is everywhere. He's in Whole Foods here in Austin. And, you know, he doesn't live here. Yeah, no, it's... it's so so what, would you, what would you say to someone who's listening and says, man, my industry is just so saturated. There's no way I'm going to break out in this. It's just everywhere I look, there's another coffee shop. There's another marketer. There's another this. There's another that. So th th this is what happens in the patent industry. If you, if you go to file a patent, the way that they issue new patents is they go, what's the prior art? And you have to establish what was done before you. And then they say, okay, why is your art different? And you have to prove why your art's different. So I say, do that in your business. If, if, you're, in the co if, you're, say, if you're trying to duplicate Starbucks, yeah, you've gotten the wrong business dummy because you're trying to be Starbucks. <laughs> Do something different. Like we have a, a restaurant at the end of the, our, our block that's, um, when they opened it, I went, oh, this place is never going to survive and I kind of want to buy it. And my wife's like, well, what do you want to do with it? I said, I want to turn it into a coffee bar. She's like, like a Starbucks? And I'm like, yeah, but I want to turn it into an Irish coffee bar where it's like there's a, it's an Irish theme. So that has great Irish food in, in the afternoon and evening and drinks and it's a bar, but in the morning, it's the Irish bar that you drive through, like Starbucks in the morning, Irish in the evening, breakfast and football on the weekends. Like you have something for every audience, but it thematically fits with an idea. She's like, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to run a restaurant or a bar. <laughs> <laughs> so if the listeners are listening, they could take that idea and run with it. Anybody can take that idea, but it's, it's applicable to anything. Is what, what do you, what's your USP of your business? And if you don't have a USP, yeah, you should be worried. Unique sales proposition. So let's get tactical for a second and then we'll talk about how people could actually pick your brain or, or access you. 
But let's get tactical for a second. What are the key elements to a really good marketing campaign? Um, first is you have to have one, a, a killer product. So let's, there's, there, let's cover that really quickly. You have to have an innovation and you have to be able to explain the innovation. So you have to be affecting people's lives in a way that hasn't been affected. Now, can you, if you're not doing that, you're in a commodity business. I don't really understand commodity businesses and I'm not good at them. So like, I'm not good at the Starbucks business. They've never been a client. GoPro, obviously innovative. The mounts were innovative. I'm jumping into that business. So innovation, then you must have margin. If you don't have margin, if you're not selling at a 5X cost of goods, you're not going to have money to one, fund your marketing to grow the business to begin with. But two, if you ever get into retail, your whole, your retail price is going to be cut in half at retailers. So you have to have those margins to be able to survive as a supplier when you get into retail. So you must have that 5X to cover your operating costs and your marketing expense acquisition of customer. Then the third, you got to have an audience. You have to have somebody who gives a shit about your product that needs that. Um, if the audience is just too tiny, it concerns me. Fortunately with the internet, you can have a small audience. I have a friend who's in, he's about to step into the uh, boating industry with a product that is very unique for deep sea fishermen, uh, sports fishermen, ocean, ocean type fishermen. I'm like, okay, that, that, product will make sense because that customer is so defined there's media that that can find this customer and the product has a strong usp and a strong margin and then the last is your responsibility as a marketer is story and that's where you start to go okay what's a campaign mean is story is how do i how do i break through the noise and get their attention first what's the what's the disruptive thing i can do up front to get attention then two how do i take my second piece and educate them as to the problem solution of what it is that will, um, one, make them attached to the problem and solution and see it as a true solution. Then the third piece is, how do you create desire with an offer? Letting them know that they can obtain your solution and it's not gonna be too painful for them, or if it's painful, it's gonna be damn well worth it. Um, and that process can be repeated, protracted, but I generally say you can close anybody with the right three questions on any product. And the first question is a question that pierces their pain or their hope. And often I use the example of, are you sick of the 10 pounds of flab that's hanging over your belt? Would you like to get rid of it? So that's from a pain perspective. You could ask the same question. Would you like to finally get that ripped washboard stomach that you've been looking for in less than six weeks? So pain or hope. You can tell them going to the same product. Then the second is there's an innovative solution where you'll never have to do a single sit up. And within six weeks, that's going to melt away. Oh, oh, now I want to know what that is. And then finally you can get that solution delivered to your house and in six weeks, get this result. And you're going to be amazed at how much it doesn't cost. You still have no idea what this product is, <laughs> but if you have that problem, you're like, all right, I'm listening. And then I just repeat the process and go deeper on each layer. Well, do you know what the real secret to your belly fat is? Blah, 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 blah. D education. The, the innovation that we've discovered is blah, 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 blah. Previously, people thought blah, 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 blah. Create the USP. Now you can try it, and this is what the process will be. Education, oh, that sounds easy enough, and it's going to cost you X. So I like that, and I think, I think we're, we're getting there in the sense of, I wanted to ask you, what can marketers, online marketers or businesses learn from infomercials? Infomercials are the marketing process in a captivated half hour sense, the half hour ones are. They're, if you think about them, I mean, it is formulated. I meant more the, I meant more the breakdown of how an infomercial goes from like start to finish. Yeah, and that's- Psychological, what like- Yeah, there's a path. And if you watch them, generally, people who are adept at them all generally use the same path and the path starts out with attention. Then, you know, there's a five minute sweet sequence we call the teaser, the open to the show that gets you to start watching the show. And there's this process of problem solution in the beginning. Then there is tease to innovation. Then there is, what is this innovation? A little bit of education. Then there's testimonials. Here's people that used it. Then there's an expert that says, Hey, all of those people are telling you the truth. Cause there's this bullshit is real bullshit. 
and then you go in and you get deeper and deeper and that process repeats. And one of the things that we get lots of complaints about historically, which is always funny is people go, God, they're so repetitive. Infomercials are so repetitive. Well, that's because it's unscheduled TV time. It's a 12 minute show that runs in segments and to make it more interesting in every segment, we add layers of education that are deeper and deeper in case you started from the beginning. But most people don't start from the beginning. They're switching channels and they start in the middle. So it has to be repetitive. So you can go, what the hell is this show about? But your marketing is the same way. That I think the trick that you have this advantage on online, and I know that you have the advantage because I utilize it. I do a ton of online marketing now, is that you get to start at a particular, some products solve three or four or five problems for people. And they serve three or four or five audiences, but you get to parse those out on the internet. And you get to solve one problem for one audience and actually create an offer that's specific for that audience. And then go on to the next audience and the next audience and do possibly you might end up with five different offers solving five different problems with one brand but the, go the global umbrella of the brand is making the same promise which is what gopro did i solve the same problem for grandfathers with atvs as i do for kids that ski as i do with dudes with motorcycles like or people women who ride horseback or grandmothers with their grandchildren i solve the same problem but how i approach the solve in the creative is different, but stylistically, any GoPro commercial you ever ran into, you immediately know it's a GoPro commercial. Because I've kept the brand integrity there. Some of the marketers that, that I speak to will look at that and be like, man, it sounds like a long process. My client is demanding a 5X return right off the bat. Yeah. So. My question is, what do you, how do you. Send them to a casino. Thought? Sorry? Send them to a casino. So that's what the point I was going with it. What, what would you say to those businesses that are like, man, I need, I need to acquire the customer and I need like a 5X return. So what is the unique sales proposition of your business with that customer? If you're, if you're out there advertising, I can make you rich fast on the internet because I know how to advertise. Okay, well, you guess who shows up at your damn door? People who are expecting a 5X. If, you're, if your message is, come, come to me based upon my experience and proof, I can help you build a multi-million dollar or billion dollar brand because I know how to do that and I've done it and I've done it with little or no money. I can do that. But I sit down with people all the time and I'm like, yeah, we can create a business that you can exit for, you know, a hundred million to 500 million. It takes us five years to do that. But that's like wanting to be in a bikini and starting at 325. <laughs> like you, it's not going to happen in a weekend. It can yeah. happen, but you've got to, you know, first we got to, go, Hey, all right, we're going to go, we're going to go to Alaska, but we're walking. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think the, the need to build a brand. And I think that's where all these online platforms are going these days is that they're rewarding the ones that are actually trying to build the brand versus trying to sell something right off the bat. Um, so you, you started talking about this. If listeners are there like, man, I completely buy into this. Right. Like I like this, what this guy's saying. Um, do you, do you teach this? Do you like what? Yeah. yeah and we we teach that. it successfully, which, which is the, that's the key is yeah, I teach it, but I teach it successfully. So one is I, I only teach things that I've done. I, I would never attempt to take you out scuba diving because I've only done that twice in my life and I would probably get us both killed. But the things that I teach are things that I do myself and I replicate. The reason I started teaching was I couldn't find employees that were like me that knew what I knew. So I started teaching it. And out of that, and so it's, there is a selfish motive sometimes in this. I have three people that now work for me that have gone through my, my course. And my course is difficult. It's called the Marketing Mercenary. It's a 13-week online course where first we deal with your money and mindset for the first couple of weeks and you're taking actions and it's a course where you have to do the homework every single week or you get thrown out the reason i set it up that way is because that's how it is in the real world with your client it's a client experience if you get an rfp and you don't file the rfp by the due date you're no longer in consideration if you file the rfp and you get considered now you might still be in a competition with three or four or five other agencies to win that business. 
and they have a due date and a meeting date that you're going to present. And if you don't get ready by that date, nobody gives a crap that your mom's sick or your dog's throwing up or that your, your kid needs a ride to school. If you miss the deadline, you're done. And the course is built that way. It's a very harsh reality, but it builds discipline into you. And that's why it's a 13 week course is because most courses, they do two things that you can power through them and get through it and go, Oh, I went through that person's course. This is a course that's lifestyle oriented. So it actually tortures you for 13 weeks to become a professional. And if you have no interest in becoming a professional, don't take the course. But if you are interested in going, I actually need to change part of my character because that's what's breaking me on success. I'm going to change your character about how you think about money, how you execute around money, how you execute around creative, how you evaluate what clients to take and what businesses to get involved, to quit taking stuff just out of starvation and take stuff that has a real chance of success, how to empathize with the audience, how to write, how to create visual content. And in it, you are constantly creating content and you're also reviewing my content. I'm giving you my stuff from multi-million dollar campaigns that has worked. There's, there's, I can think of three pieces. Like I show you how to do a Kickstarter in it um, with a, a campaign that I did. I think in the first week we did $227,000. Uh, I teach you how to do a, cam a TV campaign where I launched a brand for a company that ended up doing a hundred million dollars in its first 18 months. And you see how I did it. And I give you the parts and pieces and let you evaluate the creative along the way. So um, it's everybody who's gone through it and there's been a bunch and there's been a bunch that have been kicked out because they didn't do the work. And it's probably a, uh, in the beta program, it was probably a 70, 30 ratio, only 30% of the people who started, but I didn't charge people the first time because I wanted to know if I could teach it. And then now it's kind of flipped. It's most it's about 70% of the people put their nose to the grindstone and finish and do very good work and, uh, most of them are doubling and tripling, tripling their incomes and their revenues within a year. Is it mostly for agencies or any business can go through this? No, it's absolutely, for, it's, it's for anybody. I, I, I put my boys through it while they were in college. Um, it, if you're a business owner, if, you're, if you work at an agency, if you're in marketing, if you've ever thought you wanted to invent something, I have a, couple, I have a lot of inventors. I have a gal that, that she was a painter and she went through the course and she literally, and she's fabulously talented. She, she does all of this wild artwork um, with motorcycle tires and paint and just really extravagant, really cool stuff. Well, since she went through the course, I think she's got two galleries now and published three or four books hmm. because she got in her mind, she was working in a piecemeal business where I create something and I hand it to somebody and I create, it's craftsmanship. But then she realized, oh wait, the, I have more customers than work I can do. What if I created a distribution channel for my work and you can only imagine what that did to her personal revenue? Uh, I think it's incredible. I think you're incredible. Um, I, I, think I had to learn it all. It's, you know, everything I've learned is through failure and humiliation. It's just, I stuck with it. But that's the thing. Most people don't get back on that horse. Yeah. And quitting is way easier. Way easier. That's why so many people quit smoking 150 times. Um, Ron, you know, I quit smoking. Sorry. You know, I quit smoking years ago. You want to know how I did it? Cause I tried a lot of times. Listen, this is how I did it. I woke up one day and I said, I did it through programming. Cause we can program ourselves to do anything. If we program correctly, I said, I'm a non-smoker who occasionally smokes. And I started telling myself that thought that I'm a non-smoker who occasionally smokes which gave me the freedom to occasionally pick up a cigarette, but I didn't want him suddenly because I was a non-smoker that occasionally smoked. And within about four days, I didn't smoke. Wow. So I think your, your mindset is crazy. Let me ask you this, because uh, just based off where this is going, my final question to you is how important is it for business owners or business people to know their why? I think it's critical daily for anybody to, to just to have some, some peace and it can cause you some torture by not obtaining what you want at the same time, but at least, you know, you're pointed in the right direction. If you, if you get on a bicycle on an, on an icy lake, there's a bike lane on an icy lake and you go, I want to go home and you pick up the bicycle. What direction do you point the bike? 
towards home and you get on it and you pedal and what happens? Nothing. It spins, it spins, it spins, it spins, but you don't fall over because you have the momentum of the action and the tire slides a little to the left and to the right a little and pretty soon you get traction and because you started moving in the right direction, pretty soon you're riding a bike across an icy lake and you're doing it pretty well in a straight line. And that's what these things are is step into it and own it. So that's your why. Now, once you establish that, you may realize as you're going across that lake, oh, that's not my house. My house is over there. And now you can gradually move. You can change your why. Your why can change over time. And you don't have to be right. You have to be moving. Because once you're moving, you get from one to the next. When I started, I thought my whys were about me and my family. And now all those whys are covered. So I have a whole different set of whys now. But I would never have gotten to this whole other set that's probably operationally at a much higher level and more empathetic to mankind than if I hadn't started with myself. Love it. Ron, thank you so, so much. For people who want to reach out to you, they want to do the course or they want to just reach out and, and follow you across the platforms, where can they find you? Um, the, if you, the first thing to do, I think the, the, the easiest and simple first step for you is to go to the Big Baby Agency, Big Baby Agency Facebook page. And there's a video on there that's a half, 20 minutes long, half hour long, that shows you specific TV commercials I've done. And I walk you through kind of the selling path of, what eventually you would learn in marketing mercenary and watch that video for free and then see, you know what, this guy's full of shit or no, he knows what he's doing. He's really done it. And then at the end, you just message our page and we send you a blank document of a creative brief and you'll, that'll enter you into the pipeline and you won't even know it for the marketing mercenary. We respond to all of, cause I don't, I never want to pitch something really hard. I'd rather just people be interested in helping themselves and get into it for the right reasons. Cause it's not cheap, but it's very worthwhile. And so, that that tends to be a, a, a much better lead source of qualified people. I'll link it in the show notes. Ron, thank you so, so much. I know it's a holiday weekend. I appreciate you giving me your time. Absolutely. Thank you.